Okay, well, uh, welcome and thanks for attending today. Uh, my talk is called The Art of Post-Infection Response and Mitigation, and it's been described as brutal truth. Uh, I hope that you get some brutal truth out of this talk today. So what the hell just happened on my network? Uh, hopefully that's not a question your boss is asking you at this very moment. Uh, maybe it's a question you ask yourself now and then, what the hell happened on my network? Are you making any kind of effort to find out what happened on your network, or are you pushing the easy button, as Kiz was mentioning earlier? Um, we're gonna go over some bare bones, we're gonna go over some response methodologies. Uh, this talk is specifically about malware breaches. Uh, we're not dealing with SQL injection or anything like that, it's just malware breaches, because uh, it's a hot thing nowadays. So uh, before we get started, oops. Um, who the hell am I? Well, my name's Caleb. Uh, some people call me chill. Some people tell me to chill. Uh, by the end of this talk, you may have put me in one of those two categories. I'm a senior malware analyst at the Media Trust. Uh, the Media Trust actually has nothing to do with this talk, by the way. They do nothing that involves um, malware analysis to the degree I'm talking about here. What we do is content verification uh, if you go to any major website like Yahoo, uh, chances are good that we're probably monitoring all the third, fourth, fifth party content on that website for malicious things. Um, so yeah, that's more pre-infection and this is post-infection obviously. I'm the founder of the CarolinaCon Shootout. Uh, if any of you ever go to CarolinaCon, check us out, bring some ammunition. If you don't own a gun, bring some ammunition or a hot dogs because we like to barbecue. Um, Maybe next year there will be a RV sex shootout. We'll see. Um, RVA. Uh, I'm a dirty white hat. What's a dirty white hat? Well, I actually own a dirty white hat that I forgot um, and didn't wear today. But dirty white hat's another name for a gray hat. Um, I don't call it a gray hat because only hipsters wear gray hats. No offense if anyone's wearing a gray hat in here. Um, and I am your huckleberry. If you come to my shootout, I'll be your huckleberry. Otherwise, it has nothing to do with this talk and it's just one of the best quotes ever. Um, so, a little bit about what we're gonna go over today. Uh, we're gonna talk about the gray area that's post-infection. And we've all heard about malware breaches. You hear about malware breaches nearly every single day, uh, especially if you're on Twitter. You probably hear about them every second. We're gonna go over malware breach response methodologies. Uh, some good, some bad. And we're gonna go over some battle planning, maybe have some response in place once you get breached, because you will. And we're gonna talk about some of them tools. So at the end of the talk, I'm just gonna go over a few of the tools that I tend to use on a daily basis, um, just to kind of look more into the system, see what's going on, and actually find out what the hell happened on your network. So uh, on we go. Uh, why is post-infection kind of a gray area? That's actually a question. Does anyone have any idea why uh, it's kind of a blurry area? Hmm? Scope? Actually, that's, that's a good one. Um, I've really outlined three main reasons it's a gray area. Scope's a good one, though. Um, the first one is something, if Symantec is here, they'll recognize from their article, um, antivirus. So, if you over rely on your antivirus, you're doing yourself a disservice. Antivirus is not dead. It's by no means dead. It's just, it doesn't do the same thing it used to. It used to literally be antivirus. It would keep these Stone Age viruses off your computer. Great, perfect. Those don't exist anymore. The stuff we deal with nowadays is very complex. And antivirus is more of a breach alerting system for malware than anything. Uh, out of 100 attacks with malware, might stop one, and that's only because someone uploaded a sample to virus total or something like that, and it already has a signature. Um, but don't rely on your antivirus to prevent viruses anymore. You need it, it's an essential layer of security. You need it to tell you when you're screwed, is the basis of antivirus. So do yourself a service, have antivirus, just don't look up to it anymore. Uh, malware persistence techniques. So malware actually doesn't want you to know it's on the computer, you probably won't know. If malware does want you to be on the computer, or if malware does want you to know it's on the computer, it's gonna let you know. So 
cryptic locker. That's actually a persistence technique. It's in your face persistence technique. If it's more of a targeted attack, we might be talking about a PDF file that sleeps for a week on your HR director's computer and then detonates and does nothing but what it was supposed to do. There's no interaction with the user. You won't know it's there. If you don't know it's there, how the hell are you gonna remediate it? So, and your antivirus probably didn't catch it. Um, the third is the most important one though, and it's why I'm here today. Hopefully it's why you're here today. Lack of exposure and training. Uh, this is the big one. So if your antivirus actually does detect something, what are you gonna do about it? Call your antivirus company? What are they gonna do? Give you two free removals and charge you for the third? You have like a worm outbreak on your network, 50 nodes are infected. You know, there's only so much the AV company can do. If it was a targeted attack, they're gonna get those samples and they're gonna put them into their AV repository and guess what? There might actually be critical information in those targeted attacks directly related to your company. And then you get called out on Twitter. <laughs> so get some exposure and training, but that's what we're gonna go over here. Um, so there are actually three malware breach responses that make any sense. Uh, first one's nuke and pave. Second one's WTF, F, 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 F. And the third one's actually proper response, which all of you will do after this talk, right? Uh, so the first one we're gonna go over is nuke and pave. If, how many of you actually work in an IT department? I figured you guys would be here. Uh, so you're probably used to this first one. You're probably actually, you might be required to do this first one. It, it's quick and easy. It gets a job done and it gets Tom and HR back to Tom and HR. He doesn't have to contend with the fake antivirus that keeps popping up. You've just imaged this machine with your corporate image and call it a day, right? No, that's not right. It is quick recovery, but do you have anyone in your organization that actually knows how to handle a piece of malware? Probably not. Um, and I'm not talking about huge corporations that have a SOC. Some of you have a security administrator. Some of you have better security administrators than others. Uh, but if you're gonna do this and have this as a policy at your company, add another policy onto it. Practice some lazy admin kung fu. And I'm not talking about Wu-Tang. Uh, so lazy admin kung fu, is, it's simple. The first technique is, if you're gonna image the box anyways, copy an image for yourself. If it's Windows 7, get an image of the MBR, or the, the boot partition, get an image of the main system drive. Image that thing, give it back to Tom, and then, <laughs> you actually have yourself an organic infected image to play with. If you don't know malware, you will in two weeks if you're playing with this image over and over and over again. Image it onto another machine. You know, you don't have to actually have some huge analysis network to look at this stuff. Like a Linksys router, physical machine, maybe a VM, that's it. So it, do some lazy admin kung fu because it's gonna benefit you as well as your company. Hey, what happened? Oh, you know, we just imaged the machine, blah, blah, blah. Oh, wait, I have that image. Let me find out what happened. Let me see if anyone exfiltrated data, you know. Let me see if something crazy happened or if they're still persisting on another node in that office. The second methodology is one that really, really pisses me off. And I've seen this situation so much, it's, it's not even a joke anymore, it's just ridiculous. Um, this is the methodology where you really just do nothing. Uh, Barry was talking a little bit about that earlier. I've seen this so many times. I used to lead a malware response team. We would get on people's networks, and if you look at some of the timestamps on the actual attack files, it's been there for months. And this isn't just like grandma's chocolate shop. We're talking like lawyer's offices, urgent cares, any business you can think of that's not a huge corporation, that is a target for malware is probably gonna get infected at some point, but you have to be ready for it. And I found the majority of the people that get infected are ready to do nothing. Um, so don't be these people. If you call me up and you say, hey, Caleb, um, you know, I got this malware infection, what should I do? And I ask you how long it's been present and you tell me four months, this is gonna be my response to you. You've let this on your machine for four months how many nodes are on your network? How many nodes are taken over on your network? 
how many of your employees' passwords are set to stupid things like password because you don't have a password policy and now you've just given them a pivot point into your network for months? It's ridiculous. So don't be these people, because I'll find you. <laughs> uh, so the third one I'd like to talk about is the most interesting one, the most fun one, and the most educational. Removal and analysis. Uh, coming from a malware response team, removal analysis is always the best way to go, in my opinion. Even if you don't have time to do it right away, you know, nuke and pave it, image that machine, save the image. But removal and analysis is the way to go if you're actually gonna find out what happened on your network. Uh, if you're not gonna turn it over to the AV company, if you find a benign sample maybe, turn it over to them, make them happy, make them feel like they're doing something. Uh, but do it yourself. There's not a ton of tools out there that actually cost money that you can do this stuff with. They're all free. Um, so if you find an infection, the first thing you should do is dump some damn memory. If you can't get the full memory dump, which could be upwards of eight gigs, let's be honest, some of us have remote offices. I, my last company I dealt with, our IT, our IT department in Florida and our development team in Virginia. So they're like, oh, you know, we have a malware breach. What do we do? Well, I'm gonna get on TeamViewer and I'm damn sure not gonna transfer eight gigs over TeamViewer, even via like SCP or FTP. It's still gonna take a long time. But what can you do? There are applications where you can just pop them open and dump the memory out of that specific application rather than the entire system. Now, it may help, it may not help, but you're doing your due diligence, you're getting that memory dump. There might be you know, five bytes in that whole memory dump that even matter to the breach but you have those bytes, and no one else does. They're in the right hands, in other words. So get a memory dump. Uh, something that a lot of people don't consider with malware, get a packet capture, 30 to 60 minutes. Even if this malware has persisted on the machine for a week, who says it's not still stealing things? Who says it's not still communicating? Find the box that is infected, and don't install Wireshark on it, please. Um, the, there's a lot of things malware does. One thing is the tripwires, and I've seen malware tripwire and basically knock out the NIC card, it completely erased it from the system. Um, if you have to do a system restore to fix your machine to find the malware, you're probably not doing it right. Have a laptop, be on the same network, and uh, run Wireshark for an hour. Get that PCAP. You're gonna get a whole lot of other traffic, but guess what, Wireshark has filters. You can do file carving with Wireshark, or you can do file carving with PCAPs. So get that PCAP. If it's exfiltrating files, run something like, hey, are you familiar with like Foremost or like PCAP file carving utilities? Run it against it. You may have like Excel spreadsheets popping out of there that came from your finance department. You never know. But you won't know unless you actually look. So ma manual malware extraction. Um, Everyone in here owns a computer. Everyone in here has opened Windows Explorer. Everyone in here has actually looked at their C drive in its native form, not in the crappy My Documents categorization Windows actually gives you. You've looked at the actual file and directory tree in your system. You've taken a step farther than a lot of people have with a malware breach. You've actually looked at your system to some degree. If you're familiar with your system, you know where Gee, all my files are stored in the user's directory. You know, program data, gee, it goes in the program data directory. Temp files go in the temp directory. Look in these places. Um, dealing with malware directly for so long, I have this mental list that I go down every time I get on a machine that might be infected or has some kind of thing wrong with it. And immediately, I start looking in these places, like program data, you know? Get all the files and folders that are hidden out in the open. Turn all that stuff off, get everything visible, look in these directories. You may see Microsoft spell with a zero, you know, in program data or something like that. You may wanna look inside that Microsoft directory inside program data. They do all kind of little tricks basically to hide and persist, but you wouldn't know about these unless you look for them. And when you look for them, you actually find more places that they hide. There's a trick that they use basically where they make directories on the end of the recycle bin and they push their files into that 
file bin, or the, file, the recycle bin is not a directory. It's kind of a weird thing that Windows has to get rid of files. But if you actually look at it through the proper tool, it is a directory. And you can get into other directories that are behind that directory. And it's a popular place to store files that you don't want the owner to know are on the machine. Um, same with some, some directories in the Windows uh, directory. Like, um, they're shortcut files, basically. And uh, a virus called Zero Access was actually using one of these shortcuts and leveraging it as a directory. So if you went in it with Windows, Windows 7 especially, because it had to make all those shortcuts to meld with how the XP file structure was set up, you click on it, oh, sorry, this is in the directory. But if you actually open a tool and look at it, you go through it, it is a directory, and all the files related to this virus are stored in that directory. So manual malware extraction, very, very important. Plus, you want that sample. And the fourth one is have some kind of analysis environment. So like I was saying, two old Dell machines and a Linksys router. What you probably should have, though, is some kind of automated sandbox setup. Now, everyone says sandbox. It's, it's a new APT word. Um, if I had a drink, I would drink for saying that. Uh, so sandbox is, it's not super critical, but it's super essential. So if you want to know what happened right away, you find an executable you've extracted off the machine on your network, you could go through manual analysis for hours and not find a whole lot. You could throw it in a sandbox. You could have a sandbox client set up to look like your HR department's image. You could have one set up for your IT department's image, finance. They all run different software for different things. You know, your finance department might run QuickBooks. Have an image with QuickBooks on there, populated generically to some degree. Push this piece of malware at it, see if it goes after it. Especially if you're dealing with a PDF that was only sent to your finance department. Have that image ready, throw it in the sandbox. It may obfuscate itself a little bit because it sees it's on a VM or something, but guess what, it's better than nothing. And most sandboxes available, free ones and pay ones, have a PCAP feature. They, they will log all the outgoing and incoming data while that sample is running. And it'll print you out a really nice report that you could probably show to your manager that asked what the hell happened on his network as well. Um, so battle planning. Now, if your organization has a policy for a malware breach, great. But there's a lot of companies that don't even have one sentence in place, let alone one word. Well, they do have two words in place. It's, oh shit, is their malware breach response, basically. So what are you gonna do? If you work, say you work at an urgent care or a doctor's office, it's not a huge one. I've actually experienced this with a doctor's office, I won't tell you the state or the city, but their terminal server kept getting infected. How do you infect a server? You execute a, 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 you execute a file directly on it. These, the server kept getting infected, I had no idea why. Until I realized one day that all the nurses walk around with those HP tablets. And the nurses had no clue that every time they logged into that tablet, it was terminal services going to the server. So you have like 10 nurses basically surfing the internet from these tablets <laughs> through terminal services. The server is also where they keep all their medical data. There's no breach, res their breach response plan was to call me. And they're probably not gonna call me again because uh, <laughs> I, I kind of gave them a tongue beating a little bit uh, about not having any breach response plan in place. And this was some years ago. So provide training to your people or someone. Or someone, it, if you have an IT department, you don't have a security administrator, go to your IT department one day and say, hey, IT guys, here's some donuts. Which one of you knows how to actually handle a piece of malware? Uh, you may get in a fist fight, you may get a smile, you may get a nod make it a virus, um, but it's, <laughs> make sure someone knows. Find that guy in your IT department that goes home and plays with Metasploit in his spare time. You know, stoke that fire a little bit. Say, hey man, malware is kind of big nowadays. Um, would you like to learn more about malware in a more official way so you could help our organization? Absolutely. You know, it, you're giving a toy to a little kid basically. If you already like, have an interest in malware, why not just, make it kind of a professional career. But 
you know, that person doesn't have to be your IT department. You could work for a small organization that outsources your IT work. Call them up. Ask them if they have anyone that actually touches malware or knows how to touch malware. And don't be shocked at the answer. Um, they'll probably say, hey, you know, we can format your machine if you send it to us. Or, you know, we can have someone come on site to format that machine. Even small, like, computer repair shops that say virus removal, they, they don't offer virus removal. They offer formatting, basically, for $100 a pop. Um, so also have multiple response solutions set up. So I was talking about a worm earlier. Worms are very, very intense things on your network. If there's a worm on your network, more than likely everything's going to be running slow. Not just the internet. If you're copying a file to the computer next to you on the network, it's going to be running slow. Worms don't care. Worms basically go nuts. They try to exfiltrate as much data as they can, as aggressively as they can, from node to node to node, and they, they could really care less if you find them. And they persist really well, especially if you have shared network drives. Um, have a worm breach response in place, network breach. If you have more than one machine infected on your network, you're probably dealing with a worm or some kind of targeted attack. Have a single node breach response plan in place. You know, step one, don't turn the computer off. Everyone's been taught that. Don't turn the computer off. You're killing that infection. You're making that infection aware that, well, we're on to it. Uh, don't terminate the network connection. If you terminate the network connection and then plug it back in an hour later, I'd deem that as suspicious if I was controlling your computer. You know, you don't just reboot midday. All of a sudden, things are different after you boot back up. Nah, uh, you don't want to set off alarms because some malware authors really don't care about you, hence CryptoLocker. Um, and have a plan for false positives in place. Not many people will touch on false positives. If alarm bells on your network are going off like crazy, you should actually look and see what's making them go off. So if Notepad is being flagged on every machine in your entire organization, there's a good chance it's a false positive. Uh, not many malware authors go after Notepad, but it's a fun thing to talk about. Um, upload that Notepad.exe to VirusTotal. And I'm not going to talk at length about VirusTotal because Google owns them, for those of you that don't know. Um, every time you upload a sample to VirusTotal, they're monetizing your data. Is it a great service? Hell yeah, it's a great service. Uh, I use it, but if you're going to upload a targeted attack that hit your organization, I really wouldn't recommend it because you're sending it to Google. Google is selling it to whoever, whoever pays um, for the API key. So have a false positive plan in place. There's other things other than virus total. There's Jotty, a bunch of other stuff. A sandbox, a small sandbox environment could tell you if it was if it's a false positive. Throw notepad.exe at your array, detonate it on every machine. It's not doing anything, boom. You've just proven it's a false positive without calling your AV company, uploading it to the internet, and worrying your boss. Oh, got this handled. False positive, verified, here's a report. Sweet, go back to sitting at your desk. Um, so obviously have multiple defense methods in place. AV, perimeter devices, anything you could think of. Um, just because you have AV, like I said, you're not safe. You should have something at the perimeter that's filtering in some way, shape, or form. I mean, some people don't even have filtering on their email turned on. They just use a spam email box like it's some kind of malware filter or something like that. It's not. Um, not only have defense methods in place, but make sure everyone's aware of them that actually has something to do with them. Uh, there was an incident yesterday at my job where there was a server and no one could find it. Well, it was off. Um, but the proper person didn't know that it had been turned off, or rather not turned back on, because it wasn't on the UPS yet. But everyone that needed to know didn't know, so we couldn't find that server for like an hour, and then, well, called owing someone a beer. Um, so also, audit your damn network. How many of you have Java running on your network right now, Java runtime environment? Uh, don't, don't bullshit me, raise your hands. Okay, why do you have Java installed on your network at all? 
no, there's a lot of crappy legacy apps that use Java, unfortunately. There's a lot of companies that won't upgrade that software because it runs. Um, I understand there are circumstances where you actually have to have Java installed. So that's why I put the parentheses at the bottom. But if you don't need it, how, how many of you have to have Flash installed on the nodes at your work? Have to, for work. I didn't think so. And I know you're just not cheeky, like not raising your hand. None of you actually need Flash installed on the nodes at your office. Would you agree with that? If there's, is there any marketing people here? There you go. Yeah, so HTML5 too. Um, but yeah, Flash, Java, you're gonna have to use it. Um, there's no way of getting around it. I mean, it, I run a VM just to run Java for some stupid application I have to run sometimes. It's, I mean, it's mindless, but it's needed. Flash, good luck. I mean, if you don't need Flash on your network, I understand you're gonna disrupt everyone's lunch hour, but like, do something, get rid of it. Like, do something to stop it. Audit your people, see how many of them actually need it. I mean, it could make productivity go up or down, granted, but you know, just make sure you know what's on your network. If you're running five different versions of Flash, that's a problem. If you're running the latest, it's not as much of a problem. So audit your network and don't install Java. And you know, by all means, if she needs to open the jar, <laughs> don't tell her to install Java. Um, so tools of the trade. And this is probably one of the more interesting parts of the talk. I misspelled trade, my bad. Uh, so find and identify the malware. How do you do that? Well, first off, you know, Windows Explorer, it literally tells you what, it's, what you're gonna be doing, exploring Windows, Windows Explorer. Best utility Microsoft ever made, actually. Um, don't quote me on that. Uh, my SQL is, or MS SQL is up there with the shit show. Um, so Process Explorer, how many of you heard of Sys Internals? Yeah. <laughs> that makes me so happy. Uh, so Process Explorer is what task managers should have always been, but Microsoft didn't see it that way, and they didn't even code Sys Internals. They bought it off of someone, I'm pretty, pretty sure. So Process Explorer is task manager on steroids. You can do a lot. You can look really deep into the system. The example I have here on the screen basically is doing a single individual process dump because I don't want to transfer eight gigs over the network. What this also shows is the actual execution tree of what's going on. What, what is executing what, basically? So if you see csrss.exe executing iExplore.exe, obviously something's wrong. If you look at this stuff long enough, over and over and over again, you're gonna be able to pop this open and immediately say, why is explore.exe using like two megs of memory? Um, immediately, and then you're gonna start basically looking into explore.exe, looking what it's hooked into, what's hooked into it, anything like that. But you won't know unless you look, and you can't look unless you actually have the right tools to look. Um, something else you can do with this, which I found really interesting, especially when zero access was around, you can actually do a handle search and a DLL search to see what's hooked into what. So the example I have here is an at symbol. Why would I look for something like that? Well, zero access, when it first came out, used the shortcut directory I was describing earlier in the Windows directory. One of the files that it dropped was an at symbol. I don't know why, um, maybe just lazy fat fingering from the initial developer, but it was an at symbol. So when we started looking through the system, we actually found that that at symbol was hooked into services.exe, it was hooked into system, it, it, it was hooked into everything critical that if you shut it down, the system would just crash. How do you remove that? Well, you have to find it, and we found it. So we basically rebooted to utility disk, did some work, and uh, sometimes you, you have to do a file replacement or something like that, but you won't know unless you look. You wouldn't know this at symbol was hooked into like 15 different applications on your machine. So the third part is the properties dialog for Process Explorer. 
the best properties dialog for any running application ever. Um, and this is actually the upgraded version. I think they came out with, they may have came out with a new um, Process Explorer since I made the slide, but uh, I can guarantee you the properties page does look the same. So you can, just from the properties dialog, you can do so much. Uh, if you notice the strings um, over on the, uh, on the right side, so how many of you know what strings are? And not the kind that tie your shoe. Yeah, strings are basically just ASCII strings within anything. So Linux has a strings command built in because it's Linux. Windows doesn't, sysinternals has it. But if you run strings against an executable, it's basically gonna drop out every single ASCII readable character or string in there. Sometimes you'll see the original path that the malware author was using to develop the malware, but the actual directories will be obfuscated. Sometimes you'll see websites. I've found malware sites. I've found like just malware hotspot sites where everyone uploads their stuff and asks questions on how to make malware better in the strings. Um, I've found quotes for Pulp Fiction in the strings for malware before. You find the weirdest shit in some of these strings. Um, the Nadia virus. Do you, do you know if you remember the Nadia? The guy, the strings inside, they named it based on the strings inside the virus. It's some singer, I think it's some Bollywood singer or something, but he literally put, I love, I love you Nadia all through the strings in this malware executable. Like, she's not gonna know, bro, sorry. Um, something else you can do though, you can actually directly send the hash for this executable to virus total. So if you submit it, it's gonna upload the hash. It's not gonna upload the file. Something safe to do with virus total is look for a hash. They don't know what that hash is. They may store that hash, good for them, but they don't have the executable it's related to or whatever file that you're uploading. So a lot of sandboxes actually that have a virus total kind of module for them, they just do a hash check. Um, if any of you are familiar with the kind of Mesploit add-on, um, Slip my mind. Uh, written by Harmjoy and, but anyways, it's, it's to create payloads to get by AV and they have a module built in basically that they don't want you uploading their payloads to um, VirusTotal so they actually built a hash checker into it um, and I can't remember the name of it. I will though. So dump some damn memory, dump all the memory. Very small application, just standard EXE, and it, all it does is just memory dump. And a lot of malware actually will listen for various tools like Process Explorer. I have not had that happen with Dump It. I mean, there's a ton of other utilities you can use to dump memory. Dump It's just one. If you're just gonna do a kind of quick and dirty memory dump, just use something like this. It doesn't have to be this. It's just fun because it's called Dump It. Um, so the third tool I'm gonna talk about and I think I only have about 12 minutes left, is the one I actually wanted to get most in depth about. So, uh, PC Hunter, AKA Zooter, and I'm not pronouncing that correctly at all. Um, this is a tool I found. So another thing I'd like to preach is find more tools. Find all the tools. Evaluate them, pick the best ones out and use them. Uh, we, we ran into a lot of malware that actually was sitting at the kernel listening for tools, common tools. Uh, if anyone's familiar with TDSS Killer, built by Kaspersky, great root kit removal tool. Very, very common root kit removal tool, especially to malware authors. We've had situations where we've started up Process Explorer on an infected machine, or any of our common applications, especially sysinternals. And they just close, and then you try to open them again, and the permissions, the run permissions are gone. I mean, it's literally, Tripwire, it's literally sitting there saying, nah, not today. Um, so we had to actually find other tools to either stop it from doing that or to get around it. So I did research, I found this tool. I did a lot of research to find this tool. This tool, if you go to the website, it's just zero.com slash download, just make sure you go to slash download. The entire site's Mandarin. This is a tool coded in on mainland China by uh, a a guy, uh, I don't think his name's actually Zooter, but 
whoever he is, he did a really great job with this tool. This tool, you can look directly at the kernel modules, you can look directly into ring zero and ring three. It, I don't understand how this tool is even available for free. Actually, he did make a paid version, um, but you know, you gotta monetize somehow. So there are several, several things you can do with this tool. Actually, I could stay in here five more hours and tell you about this, but um, other stuff you can do with this tool is basically you can see if an application has ring three access. Uh, you can see what's hooked into it. There's just, this is process explorer on steroids almost. So quick and dirty, if you just need as much information off the machine as possible, you need to get out of there for some reason, it actually has an examination report that, as you can see, will list all kernel modules, processes, ex hooks, and everything of that nature. Um, the reason I'm talking about this tool specifically in relation to malware basically nullifying our tools for reason to remove it is we were able to actually look into the kernel modules. Um, I think actually we're looking at the kernel callbacks. So everything suspicious shows up in red. All of a sudden we ran Process Explorer, it got nullified. We look and all of a sudden, oh, hey, there's a line in red. What happens if we delete it? Oh, Process Explorer runs, perfect. Um, so, a word of warning. This tool's excellent, it's super sweet, but every tool that you come across that you've never used before, treat it like a piece of malware, because it might be. Um, really good idea to build malware that looks like malware removal tools. Uh, this is not a piece of malware, this does nothing malicious, but, but, um, when you run this, it calls out to China. Like three or four IPs. <laughs> and depending on actually what version of this you're running, this is PC Hunter 64 bit, used to be called Zooter. Um, this is the free version. If you run the, uh, the paid version, it, it connects to even more IPs in China, like Chinese IP blocks, period. It's not just connecting to some random .cn like these are static IPs it's connecting to quite literally. So it, it's, it's purely for registration type stuff, but who knows? Um, I got asked, asked um, at CarolinaCon basically, what if it was using like DNS transmission method? Well, great. If you don't trust it, don't use it. Um, but I'm just saying, if you do find tools like this out on the web, Test them first. You know, run Wireshark, open it, see what it connects to. Um, and actually, another tool I'll talk about real quick is uh, TCP View. Whoa. TCP View is kind of a GUI net stat that does a lot more. It's interactive real time. Um, I use this to find worms immediately. If, uh, if there's a worm on the box, it's making shit tons of outbound connections. Every new connection on here shows up in green. Every connection that gets disconnected turns red. When you see a worm in TCP view, I call it the Christmas effect because it's just red, green, red, green, red, green. Like, it's crazy. It's connecting to literally everything it can. Another time that you will see that kind of activity, though, is if you have a if you're a node on a peered botnet. Um, if you're a node on a peered botnet, it's connecting to other peers that are you know, machines that have been taken over. So TCP view right off the bat, if you were to open it on an infected machine and take a look at it and just see what's going on, I mean, it tells you what executable it's originating from. Boom, oh, this is infected, we should do something. But you wouldn't know unless you looked. Um, and this is actually the tool. Um, so, let's see, find an interesting point. I should have probably infected this VM, but it probably would have infected my PowerPoint. Um, also, something else, if you'll notice, if you look at the top left side of the corner, um, the, it doesn't say PC Hunter or Zooter. Uh, something else about this tool I found really neat. A, it drops its own driver. B, it self obfuscates upon execution. So there's another tool that kind of does this called Gmer, but it does it with the actual file name. This, every time you run it, new string, completely different. What does this prevent? The malware from shutting it down. It can't find it. 
Um, and also it has a lot of Mandarin in it, so uh, it was kind of rough for me too. <coughs> so take a deeper look with sketchy tools. <laughs> Just make sure they're not sketchy or they're sketchy to a level that you're comfortable with. <laughs> yeah, don't download any of this shit from SourceForge, please. So other tools that are very useful for these situations. Some, some of these tools you may have heard of, some you may have not of. Some you're like, how, how does this deal with malware? You know, how would this actually work with an infection on my network? Volatility, if you don't know what volatility is, Google it, Ex excellent memory forensics framework. Uh, Remnux, very nice utility disk that actually I believe it has volatility on. Um, Kali Linux, uh, Kiz was talking a little bit about Kali earlier. Sys internals, Sys internals, there's not just three tools, there's like 30, 40. Um, I just went over Process Explorer because it's the more general purpose of any uh, tool in there. So any user could open it up and actually kind of see what's going on. Um, plus there's just too many to go over. Jimer, Jimer, which I was just talking about that obfuscates itself via the file name. Uh, and if you didn't know, PSS killer technology was bought from Jimer. Um, Jimer is good on 32-bit boxes, 64-bit, it's good at blue screening. Um, but Jimer also has a file browser in it. And earlier I was talking about malware persistence where they hide these directories you can't get to through normal means. Zooter, oh, we'll call it PC Hunter. PC Hunter, Jimer, both actually have file browsers in them and they don't use explore.exe. So you will see things you never knew were in there. You will go into directories that like literally command line in Windows all day you couldn't get into. But with these file browsers, since they actually don't use Windows natively, they actually just pop right in and they have really neat features like delete and lock or delete and replace or you know pause, it's crazy stuff like that. Um, Cuckoo, obviously, I'm Cuckoo for malware and so is Cuckoo Sandbox. Cuckoo Sandbox is free, it's awesome. It's a little rough to set up, but after you get it set up, very, very pristine, nice tool to have at your disposal. Um, right side of the screen pretty much is just utilities that you can boot to. So Remnux, obviously. Uh, has anyone heard of Helix? Do we have any forensic guys in Yeah, okay. Uh, Helix is more of kind of a forensic um, installation, but you know, it has a lot of tools on, so boot it up, see what it does. Use some stuff on it and uh, have a beer. So Deft, uh, Deft is actually similar to Helix. Um, the reason I actually found Deft on my tool hunt was because I was trying to actually extract data from a uh, HFS plus drive or something like that. And Helix, and I think I tried another one, they just, they couldn't actually look at the data. Deft had the correct drivers, just boot it up, pull the data off and call it a day. Hirons Boot CD. How many of you heard of Hirons? Sweet. So that's actually the most important uh, picture on here. So Hirons Boot CD, it's slightly illegal because it has a modified version of Windows XP on it, which is awesome, by the way. Uh, when you boot to it, you can either literally boot into Windows XP, a mini Windows XP that actually, <laughs> there's a WIM file you can actually edit and you can customize this ISO to whatever you want. Uh, you can boot into Linux, which is parted, parted magic, parted Linux, I believe. Um, there's just tons and tons and tons of tools. Depending on what version you get, it might have Norton Ghost on it. Um, any semantic people, you didn't hear that from me. So Hirons Boot CD is great because it's 500 megs, it's an ISO, you can customize it. I got mine down to 100 megs. Why is that important? If you have an organization where you're probably gonna get a malware breach, you have multiple offices all over the country, wouldn't it be nice just to have a response ISO that that office could download and burn real quick, boot it up, I actually even got this to auto fire up the network drivers and start TeamViewer. There's a version of TeamViewer included on it. So I, I could actually have someone boot to this disk in San Diego. I could remote into the booted disk and I could actually look into their system and remove the virus or do whatever was needed. And that was the 100 meg disk. There's a lot of stuff on there. The Opera is a file, uh, the uh, web browser. Just There's a lot of stuff on there. I think they even have a version of Malwarebytes on there, but you know, who, who does that? Um, but anyways, highly customizable, 
Uh, I'd highly recommend looking into it. It's not hiringsbootcd.com. It's some weird thing you can Google for to get it. But uh, all these tools, if you play with these, you're going to do yourself a huge favor. But um, yeah. Uh, oh, and Wireshark. Mainly get it because it's a fucking shark icon. Like, how could you not get it? So yeah. <laughs> um, so that's it. Uh, hopefully you guys have learned a lot today and hopefully I won't have to strangle any of you later. <laughs> Thank you.